Hello everybody, Arjun here. So I used to do brief political histories, but I didn't think they were very good. Because I just kind of rambled on about what had happened in the country for the last hundred years. And then I, um, that was kind of back before I adopted the modern reactionary review in character profile. And I kind of blended a lot of that together to make the in real life character profiles, which kind of mixed history, but also kind of trying to do the theme. So maybe I'll, I'll blend them both together and do like 20 minute to half hour country profiles where I kind of try to talk about the big historical events, but more kind of like I do with character profiles, drilled down into what's the heart and soul of the country. What are kind of the main themes about the country? So what better place to start with than the country that you can barely believe even exists in the real world? North Korea. Now, before we get into North Korea, I think there's two things you have to understand. The first is nothing with North Korea is like, is what it seems. A lot of things that might seem stupid to us, a lot of things that might seem irrational or counterproductive or crazy have a definitive purpose. Um, it's, it's not so much stupid as just alien, um, especially if you're a Westerner. The way North Korea is run is, is completely alien to you. The other thing you have to disabuse yourself of, or you won't make any sense of the country, is that North Korea is not a left-wing state. It's, it's, per, it's in many ways kind of the furthest thing from a left-wing state possible. You would be excused for thinking it was a, a state of the far left, since it has all the trappings of it. We have the Red Star, we have the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, you have the Koreans' Workers' Party, which is actually kind of ironic, as we'll see in a minute. But in, in a very real sense, it's just what, what remains of communism, if the country could ever really have been, been called real, real communism, has long since faded. Uh, the book I just finished reading says, I think there's only one picture of Karl Marx left in all of North Korea. I don't think there are any statues of Stalin or Lenin left. If you look at China, there's that really famous picture of uh, Marx, Lenin, Stalin, Mao. And you see that in um, Soviet iconography too. They have pictures of almost kind of like hagiographic pictures, so it's showing a profession of ide procession of ideas. But no, North, North Korea is not a Marxist state. It is not a communist state, regardless of what they say. I think the best way to understand it is North Korea is a state of the extreme right. I don't say far right. I mean extreme right. Uh, the closest example I guess we have to work with is probably uh, National Socialism in Germany. Actually, National Socialism is a very good way to describe the government of North Korea. Um, it is a national and social government, not a, a communist government. And we'll get, we'll get into that in a minute. But it's also ironic that the party in Korea is the Korean Workers' Party. You know, uh, German Workers' National Socialist Party. Kind of an interesting parallel. Now, I don't say that as a, a slur on... Uh, either Korea or the National Socialist Party of Germany. I just say it as kind of a political science um, point because it's hard to find examples of extreme right totalitarian regimes. A lot of them kind of existed in countries where totalitarianism just wasn't very doable. Um, I'm sure Mussolini would have liked to have a totalitarian government um, but the Italian people are just too hard to control. Um, he tr he tried. Uh, I remember reading whenever they tried to do kind of cult of personality or like Mussolini Day or whatever, the Italian people just took the day off and just went to the beach or whatever. And it was really hard to just get them to go along with it just because they're lower trust and they're kind of a more locally oriented people. They aren't like Northern Europeans who are a lot more uniform and, and are kind of a lot easier to get to go along with a hive mind. They're more naturally collectivist. And it's kind of interesting because East Asians are like that, of course, even more so. Um, that's kind of the, the part of the joke behind China economy strong is, is the kind of ant-like mentality. I mean, that's if you look at Chinese history and you look at any battle or any emperor, it's always involves a staggering amount of death um, with mild concern. 
be it building the Great Wall, be it civil wars, be it pointless fights against barbarians, you just see massive body counts wherever you turn in China. And there doesn't seem to be a great deal of concern for human suffering. Now, there's a concept that dates back from Roman times called Oriental despotism. And it's kind of contrasted with more kind of Western ideas of government. Now, Oriental despotism is basically the idea where you have a monarch who is a, a god king or in a monotheistic religion is the direct apostle of, of God. And he rules with absolute power. And despotism is, is a form of government where there's just the ruler and the people. There's no one in between the ruler and the people. Um, I know in ancient Greece, that's what they called despotism. And that's what they call the tyranny. It was a form of government where one man rules with the support of the masses. So that's kind of what you had in, in countries like China to a certain extent. You had the emperor who was all powerful. Um, then you had a bureaucratic class. They had some nobility, but it didn't really work like the nobility in the West. Uh, the bureaucrats in China were moved around the country. They didn't really have a strong local power base. All power kind of flowed from the font of the throne. Whereas in Europe, um, power kind of flowed from the nobility up to the king. Um, as you can see in like the baronial revolts in England or any number of times in France, the nobles could and did provide checks and balances on the power of a king. In kind of an oriental or, or kind of eastern state, um, the emperor could basic or king could basically do anything they wanted. Uh, there was also in um, in the uh, kind of Sinosphere, kind of like Japan, China, Vietnam, kind of those countries, uh, there is the lasting influence of Confucianism and Neo-Confucianism which is all about uh, collectivism, social hierarchy, and splitting society into multiple pieces. It's especially interesting to keep in mind that in Confucianism, the lowest class of society is merchants, below even farmers and workers. Confucianism views uh, merchants and I guess kind of capitalism and the economy in general as being kind of degenerate. In contrast to serving in the army, being a bureaucrat, etc., etc. So why do I bring this all up? Why did I just do a seven minute long rant on that? Because I think you have to understand all of that to understand North Korea. North Korea is in many ways um, a supremely reactionary state. It's a country that does not want to enter into the, the modern world. So let's just go over this. So we enter into Kil Is Il Sun. Now, knowing exactly what his past is, is very difficult because it's been mythologized so much. From what we know, though, he was a communist guerrilla who fought against the Japanese. Um, he was known and he had some fame and the Soviets believed that they could control him. So when they invaded and took over North Korea, they set him up as a satellite state. They provided him, of course, with a bunch of tanks and weapons and stuff, and he invaded the South. And then uh, the Korean War happened, and it wound up in a stalemate with North Korea being the communist state in the North and South Korea being the Republican and eventually Democratic state in the South. So you have the, um, the division of society into halves. Now, it should be noted that prior to the Japanese occupying the country for only really, um, I guess it was like 40 years or so, you had 3,000 years or so where Korea was a absolute monarchy. It was a empire modeled on China. Uh, it had a class system, a caste system. It had it kind of a centralized power structure. And there was a lot of elements of civic religion. So that just couldn't disappear overnight. Um, nor could it really adapt communism as we understand it in the West. Because there just there wasn't a capitalist class, there wasn't really there was a bit of a working class. It's interesting because until I think it's the 1970s, North Korea was actually significantly more wealthy than the South. You see, when um, Japan had Korea as a colony, uh, North Korea is where they built all the processing plants. 
So they built a fair amount of industry in North Korea. The idea being they took the resources from Manchuria and the other parts of China they controlled, and then they refined them a bit in North Korea and sent them to Japan. So North Korea inherited all of that. They also got a lot of subsidies, a lot of engineers, a lot of technical know-how from the... So for um, the first couple of decades, North Korea was substantially wealthier than the South because they had the industry from Japan, and then they had a lot of industrial and financial aid from the Soviet Union and China. Now, what kind of happened is after Stalin died, um, North Russia went through what came to be known as revisionism, where a lot of kind of the cult of personality was gotten rid of, a lot of the totalitarian elements were kind of stripped up, stripped out. Uh, Russia be, remained a very um, authoritarian, brutal police state, but a lot of kind of the excesses of the Stalin years were not only stopped, they were condemned. Now, North Korea didn't like this. Um, Kim Il-sung had basically meant, uh, taken the trappings of communism and kind of mixed it with uh, traditional Korean government. So he ruled the country as an oriental despot. Um, he made himself into basically a semi-divine figure. Um, and and it's, it's the idea that he is the divine figure and there's no one to mediate between him and the, the peasants. So you have basically the god king, and then you have the people, and there's not really anything in between. And the state as it exists, exists solely as an extension of the, the great leader. I think under Juche ideology, the idea is that the, the supreme leader is a conduit for, for national greatness. That the entire will of the Korean people are channeled into... Uh, the leader, and he is divine because of that. If this sounds a bit kind of like Hitler and Nazism, uh, that's that's because it, it is kind of similar. Much like Hitler was the Fuhrer, or kind of the embodiment of the German people, um, Kim Il-sung and his successors kind of have a similar role. There's also kind of inherent in this a rejection of materialism and kind of a, a spiritual aspect to it. Whereas National Socialism was about the spirit of the Volk or the German people and the opposition to Marxism because of its internationalist character, because of its materialist character, um, Juche, which is, we'll get to Juche in a second, but basically it was the ideology Kim Il-sung came up with. And it was based on kind of uh, ideas about Korea because Korea didn't really have any of the experiences of capitalism it had an experience of being occupied by China and Japan, and it had an experience of an, a kind of an oriental despotism. So he was able to have a one-party uh, totalitarian nationalist state, but kind of this global communism just didn't really appeal to Kim Il-sung or to the Korean people. And indeed, it, they, they um, came to reject it, because that was kind of the initial idea behind communism, was it was going to be internationalism, everyone was going to be equal, everyone was going to, um, there was just going to be like one world government, borders in the state would disappear. But Kim Il-sung kind of, to a large extent, drove his legitimacy from Korean nationalism. And not just that, but the, to a certain extent, and we'll, let's talk about Juche now, um, there's a belief in, in North Korea that the Korean people themselves are divine. And that is in a spiritual but also a biological sense. So there's an immense um, focus in North Korea on racial purity. Um, it's perhaps the most um, xenophobic country on earth, and I use that term unironically. Anything that's not Korean um, or considered quintessentially Korean is despised. Um, the remaining minorities in North Korea, be it the Chinese, Japanese, or a couple Westerners, have been driven out a long time ago, or the couple remaining ones are used as showpieces. During the um, early days of the Soviet Union, um, a number of Warsaw Pact members married Korean women, and the Korean women were forced to divorce them, and they were kicked out, and the uh, half-breeds were kicked out as well. 
And in North Korea, they frequently will euthanize or kill people who are born with disabilities because they're obsessed with the purity of the race. And they believe so long as the race remains pure, North Korea will remain um, a powerful country. Once again, a lot of this sounds very similar to National Socialism because Juche is basically National Socialism. So Juche is very hard to describe because it's, it's kind of not really a coherent ideology. It's basically just, it's, it's sometimes called Kimism. Juche means self-reliance. Basically, it's the same thing as National Socialism as applied to Korea. It's the idea that the, that the Korean race needs to be autonomous. Um, it needs to have autarky. It needs to be self-sufficient, self-reliant. Um, it, it promotes the idea of the purity of the Korean race um, and the need for the Kim family to be the, the embodiment of the Korean race and for there always to be a Kim in power. And once again, this, this sounds very similar to some thoughts about Nazi Germany, um, kind of independence from the international financial system, um, the one leader who's the embodiment of the people, an emphasis on the purity of the race, and a, a, a hatred kind of, of of what's external. Now, another aspect and why I call this a regime of the far right is something called Songbun. I, I can't pronounce Korean, so I'm not sure what it's like. So Songbun is basically a caste system. Um, there's three castes. There's the loyal class, the wavering class, and the hostile class. Now, the loyal class are descendants of Communist Party officials, uh, the initial revolutionaries, other kind of key figures to the founding of North Korea. Uh, the wavering class is people who weren't involved with it, and the remaining 20% were landlords, merchants, or Christian missionaries. And why it's caste is they believe that it is biological to a certain extent. You sometimes hear kind of really kind of radical neo-Nazis talk about the traitor gene. So it's, it's almost impossible to raise your... Sorry, the traitor gene. So the traitor gene is this idea that people who act against Western countries have this gene within them that makes them act this way. It's not that they're bad people. It's not that they've been culturally conditioned. Uh, there's, there's a physical gene within them that causes them to act in this, this way. And North Korea has a similar idea that you're a member of a class. They even call it, uh, they call it a hereditary caste system. And a bad um, background is described as tainted blood. So it's literally biological. So you have people who are maybe descendants of Christian ministers and they go, well, the, the, um, the blood of, of looking to things that aren't innately Korean transfers down. Um, being a merchant transfers down. Um, being a landlord transfers down. And not only does it, there, there's that, but there's also the practical aspect of it. It's very easy to keep people in line that way because you can't, it's very hard to improve your shunbun, sangbun, but it's very easy to drop it. Um, if you commit a political crime, you don't show enough enthusiasm, you steal, you commit some sort of crime against the state, which is basically everything. Um, marrying someone of lower standing, whoever has lower standing, um, if, if like someone from the core class marries someone from the hostile class, then they both become hostile class. So... If someone commits any of the uh, the crimes I mentioned, it not only lowers their Songbun, but it lowers everybody in their family, everybody in their immediate family, and all of their descendants for the next three generations. And three generations pass. So when someone commits a crime or whatever, um, the entirety of their family goes into the camps. Now, once again, this may sound crazy, but in their mind, their belief is that this the treachery or the disloyalty is caused by genetics. So the idea of imprisoning everybody who might share their genetics makes a lot of sense.
So a lot of this came about because of revisionism, uh, as I was talking about earlier, where the Soviet Union kind of de-Stalinized. They got rid of a lot of the totalitarian aspects in the cult of personality. And North Korea didn't want to do that. And because they didn't want to do that, they started getting scared of the Soviet Union. They thought the Soviet Union would force revisionism on them. So they kind of, after, after de-Stalinization, they kind of turned towards China. And, and for a while, they were kind of closer to China, but then the Cultural Revolution happened there. And Korea kind of became scared, North Korea became scared that China would, under the radicalism of the Cultural Revolution, invade North Korea. So you had kind of a couple decades where North Korea would, would switch back and forth between the two to get more and more money. And over time, um, all pretense of communist ideology was dropped, and it just basically is now an absolute hereditary monarchy um, with totalitarian elements and some communist stuff to it. Uh, I guess kind of some communist um, decals to it. You ever had that when you were a kid? You had like the little Hot Wheels car, and then you put on these, these stickers, but it didn't really change anything. It just looked kind of cool. That's basically what communism is like in Korea. I mean, you have the Korean Workers Party, but it's it's really just kind of it's kind of a mixture. I guess you could say it's syncretic. But basically, what's kind of happened over time is throughout the nineteen eighties, Soviet aid started to go down, and the industry got very old, and the country had electrical and uh, food shortages and resource shortages. So the economy kind of started to collapse. And it got, it, it got, when it got really bad was when the Soviet Union collapsed and it wasn't willing to give them money anymore. It wasn't willing to subsidize them. And China wasn't particularly interested at that point in time either. So North Korea went through a famine, all the factories stopped. To this day, the, um, all the heavy industry is basically either out of date or has just collapsed from misuse or can't be used because of electricity. The only part of North Korean society that still gets anything resembling adequate resources is the army. Um, they call it Songun, I believe, or Songun, uh, which is military first, which is the idea that all the resources of the state have to be directed towards the military. Um, and North Korea is one of the largest militaries on earth, but once again, it's kind of a paper tiger. Um, North Korea's army would be destroyed in a matter of days because it's mostly from the 1950s and 60s of their equipment. It's not well maintained. It's falling apart. And against South Korea, which also has conscription and has much, much better technology, uh, they would be slaughtered. Like, even a dozen South Korean tanks, if they had enough ammunition, could probably destroy all the North Korean tanks because it has... Uh, Chobaham armor, which is basically impenetrable to weapons made before the modern era, uh, with the depleted uranium overlay on it. So what's happening now and kind of what's going to happen in the future with North Korea? The reason it still exists and the reason it will probably exist into the future is no one has anything to gain by changing the status quo. So let's look at the involved parties. China has to throw them some aid every now and again, but throwing them some aid is, is not a huge deal. It doesn't break the bank. China has a big economy, um, and, and it gives them the advantage of having a buffer state, so they're not bordering this strong American um, allied first world country with, with a powerful army. In fact, China has some fears that if Korea were ever reunited under the South, that they would start getting irredentist ideas about parts in Manchuria. Now, is that plausible? Probably not, but China's pretty okay with the current situation. Um, being the kind of older brother of North Korea means that they can exploit North Korea's resources. Now, the South also doesn't have a lot to gain by the situation changing. If North Korea were to fall, the government was to fall tomorrow, uh, the South would be on the hook for this basket case of a country. I've seen estimates that South Koreans are on average 40 times as wealthy as North Koreans. And you'd have to assimilate this, this 
place part of the country that would basically you would have to rebuild everything because everything's just complete garbage all the infrastructure all the electricity all the power plants all the industry everything would have to be rebuilt you'd inherit a population that's largely uneducated um, the education they have is not relevant the engineering is on the engineering is trained to use stuff that's like 50 years old same with the doctors um, most of the, the intellectuals are skilled at talking about things that never happened, uh, but they're hardly modern social scientists. The book I was reading said the only group of people who would probably be able to do okay is people who teach math, geometry, and physics, because that doesn't change that much. And they'd probably be able to keep their job, but they'd have to deal with paying welfare to all these people. They'd have to deal with retraining all of them and basically dealing with a complete basket case. It would probably bankrupt them. As the book says, um, what East Germany was probably only about um, a third or as half as poor as West Germany. East Germany was like industrialized. It had a, a fairly functional economy. It just wasn't as wealthy as the West, but it was like a fairly well-developed country. North Korea is <clears throat> one of the most just kind of it's just a mess in every sense of the word. America doesn't have a ton to lose because the current situation isn't really that bad for them. Um, South Korea is their ally. North Korea doesn't really harm them in any way. North Korea is just kind of there. Um, shaking up the status quo might put them into conflict with China. It might hurt their relations with South Korea. There's no real reason for them to try and change the status quo. Uh, North Korea realizes this. Um, they realize that if their regime were to be taken down, they would have to invade the country. And neither the South, the South nor China, nor um, America really wants to do that. Well, North Korea is has a large army. It is extremely out of date, and they would lose a conventional war. But they, they really have no intention of fighting a, a conventional war. There's no need to fight one. They just have to have a large enough army that it makes it unpleasant to invade them. And that was kind of the basis of the nuclear weapons program was to give them leverage. Because now that the Soviet Union's gone and there's a, their economy's a mess, what they have left to bargain with is to basically upset the status quo. And that's where atomics come in. They will never be able to hit America, but they could lob one at Seoul. They could lob one at Tokyo or some other major population center. Now, they would get obliterated if it happened, but do we really want to take that chance? If North Korea has absolutely no options left and it starts lobbing nukes or just uses conventional missiles and artillery and flattens some southern cities and hundreds of thousands or millions of people die, do we really want that to happen? Isn't giving North Korea like a couple tens of millions of dollars of food aid here and there much preferable to that? And that's kind of the status quo, and that's why the whole thing's frozen at the moment. Um, because getting rid of North Korea and taking down the regime there would be bad for everybody, including the leadership of North Korea. So they've kind of positioned themselves that way. So the book I was reading talked about what are, what are the possible conclusions to this? How could this end? One of them was that it just completely implodes and they appeal to China for aid, and North Korea basically just becomes an outright satellite state of China. Um, maybe China will move in military advisors, they'll partially militarily occupy the country, but China will basically, uh, North Korea will just become an extension of China. It'll become um, a special economic zone like Hong Kong or something, and Chinese companies will just develop the country into a satellite state which is um, what he said that the regime of North Korea is probably most in favor of, because they would probably be allowed to stay in power, albeit under Chinese guidance. Um, there's, the issue, there's the possibility that North Korea may just institute reforms on its own, which there's some signs of happening, but ultimately the government's worried if they go to a democracy or if unity happens, then they're all going to be hung from trees, which is probably correct. Um, the, the, he said the most likely option is eventually when the country kind of implodes and they go through another famine, uh, the six parties, which are South Korea, North Korea, 
United States, Japan, and Russia will collectively occupy North Korea. And they'll be kind of a transitional government in which North Korea gets, um, they, they start to have some capitalism there. They may be, they have a confederacy where North and South Korea are kind of joined, but they're separate and they have separate budgets and separate economies. And North Korea just starts to experiment with capitalism. And eventually, once its economy develops at least somewhat, then they slowly start to integrate it with the South, which is their view of the most likely things to happen. So they said the two things that they think are most likely are either a collapse of the country and all parties agree to a gradual merger, or it just becomes an outright Chinese satellite state. So we don't know what's going to happen. For the moment, though, as long as they have nukes and as long as um, they're capable of bullying the surrounding countries into giving them food aid, it doesn't look like anything's really going to happen in the foreseeable future. So that's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. This is Arjun, and I'll talk to you guys later.